So welcome back, everyone. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Green Mountain Care Board. I'm going to call the board uh, back into session. And uh, the first item on this afternoon's agenda will be the minutes of uh, June 9th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved by Maureen and seconded by Jess to approve the minutes of Wednesday, June 9th, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, please signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the minutes were uh, approved unanimously. The next item on this afternoon's business is going to be um, Vermont Information Technology Leaders, and I'm going to turn the uh, meeting over to Sarah Kinsler. Sarah. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm just going to take a moment to share my screen. Are folks able to see the first slide? We can, yes. Excellent, thank you. Um, so for the record, this is Sarah Kinsler, Director of Health Systems Policy at the Green Mountain Care Board. I'm going to give you a very brief overview of the board's oversight authority related to the Vermont Information Technology Leaders Budget. Uh, VITAL is Vermont's designated sole health information exchange network. Uh, I'm also going to summarize VITAL's budget submission presented on June 9th and give a staff recommendation. Uh, and I believe that there is a um, potential vote noticed for today. Um, so as part of its oversight and policymaking activities related to health information technology and health information exchange, the board is required to review and approve VITAL's budget annually. Uh, this came to the board as an authority in 2015, first exercised in 2016. Um, the board's oversight is intended to provide strategic guidance and policy parameters. Um, so this slide uh, summarizes VITAL's FY22 budget uh, submission, and I will not read it thoroughly for you, um, but I'll just say um, for revenue vitals got 1.6, 1.7 million. Uh, state funding is the vast majority of that. Um, and that is an increase from um, vitals previous, previous budget forecast. And I'm using the budget, the FY21 uh, mid-year forecast uh, as a comparison point because there was kind of some, some up and down in there um, in the previous fiscal year. Um, this reflects a significant shift in scope between the calendar year 2021 and 22 contracts between um, VITAL and the Department of Vermont Health Access, its primary funder. Um, in addition, there's a slight increase in non-state funding on the other side. Um, for expenses, VITAL's got one, uh, 11.2 million. Um, biggest categories here are labor-related expenses, including salary and fringe. Um, consulting and contract labor are vital in their budget presentation, gave an overview of kind of why uh, the consulting uh, and contract labor line is so high and why they're kind of preferring to, to lean on that for some shorter term projects, um, as well as software and uh, server and maintenance. Um, Vitals also included some built in contingencies on both the revenue and, and expense side to kind of pr protect against lost revenue or expenses uh, greater than, than predicted. So moving on to the review criteria, the board's annual vital budget guidance, which was first approved in April, uh, includes four principles for use uh, in reviewing the budget. Uh, and these are, are very similar to the principles we'd used in the past, but are now um, kind of codified in that guidance. Uh, these are listed in the guidance as well as on the board's website. Um, and in the following slides, I'm gonna walk through these criteria along with the staff assessment of whether the criteria were met. So first, uh, the review process will be transparent. Transparency is measured by compliance with the budget guidance and the overall transparency of the budget process. Um, and in this case, staff find that VITAL has complied with the budget process. Uh, the budget was submitted in a, in a timely fashion um, and it includes uh, all the requested components. Um, VITAL also responded to board members' written questions about the budget in a timely fashion and provided additional information where requested. Um, the, the narrative that VITAL submitted, the FY22 budget documents, as well as VITAL's most recent audited financials um, and Form 990 are also posted to the GMC website, and there's a link included in the slides here. Um, secondly, the review process will incorporate uh, public input. input. 
Um, and here, Vital presented at the June 9th uh, board meeting and responded to comments and questions from board members as well as the public. And in addition, there was an open public comment period, a special public comment period that is uh, that was open between June 9th and June 18th, uh, and we received no written comments. Um, third, uh, the board will review Vital's budget order uh, in order to determine whether it reflects a strategy and priorities consistent with the state's health reform goals and the HIT plan, more commonly known as the HIE strategic plan these days. Um, the board won't direct the technical details of Vital's work or the details of Vital's contractual relationship with the state, um, but we're, we're really focused on those HIT plan goals. Uh, so here, uh, staff assessed alignment relative to the goals of the 2020 update to the HIE strategic plan. That's the most recent version. Uh, it was approved by the board in November and is available on our website. Um, and we found that um, VITALS budgeted activities will advance the goals of the HIE plan, which are listed um, on the prior slide. Um, by pushing toward more effective foundational services, exchange services, and end user services. These are categories which reflect the Office of the National Coordinator for HIT's framework for describing critical health information exchange services, um, which our HIE plan relies on quite a bit and which is pictured here. Um, the budget submission includes a table, which I've referenced here on the slide, um, Table 1, Section 1. Uh, it's on page 5 of the narrative. Um, which really categorizes Vitals revenue uh, and revenue sources um, and, and kind of major projects by these categories, which we found helpful in making this review. Finally, the board's review process must be structured and timed in order to assist DIVA and Vital in negotiating timely effective agreements each year. And, and staff have worked closely with DIVA and Vital to prepare the timeline for this year's budget review to make sure that that was the case. Um, and we'll ensure that that written decision stemming from any votes um, will also be sufficiently clear. So given those findings, staff recommend approving the vital budget as presented with two conditions. Um, first, vital will comply with quarterly reporting requirements described in the annual budget guidance. Uh, and in addition to topics and metrics described in that guidance, we identified uh, a couple of specific areas here that we would like uh, vitals uh, quarterly reporting to include updates on. Uh, first, uh, work on designing the future financial model, including charging fees to users of its services. Uh, second, vital strategic planning process, which we heard a little bit about at the June 9th meeting. Um, third, work to pilot integration of claims and clinical data in the VHI. And fourth, continued work on consent, in particular for sensitive data types. Um, and then the second condition is that vital, uh, that, that staff recommend is that vital uh, will comply with the mid-year budget update requirements as described in the annual budget guidance. Um, that is all from the staff recommendation. Um, does the board have any questions about Vital's budget or the recommendation? Thank you, Sarah. Does any member of the board have any questions for Sarah? I do. Um, just a, a quick one. Uh, um, I, I was interested in their sustainability modeling um, um, and how that related to their unrestricted net assets. I asked a question uh, about that during the process. I'm just wondering if, if Sarah, you would feel it reasonable um, on your draft motion here to say vital strategic planning process, including the sustainability model profiling desired level, the desired level of unrestricted net assets, because uh, it was a big number. It was like 45 percent of their uh, of their income, and and I just want to make sure that doesn't get get kind of lost in 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 the conversation as we move forward. I don't have a problem with it. I just just want to highlight it. I am very comfortable with uh, um, amending the that that proposed motion. I think that that makes great sense. So for the purposes of discussion, Tom, how about you make a motion? <clears throat> OK, um, I make a motion that um, the staff recommendation be amended to include language following vital strategic planning process, um, uh, including sus uh, the sustainability model pro that uh, profiling the desired level of unrestricted net assets. So Tom, can I interpret your motion to be that um, you're moving as uh, we see on the slide, plus the additional language regarding the strategic planning process. Uh, um, absolutely. Thank you for clarifying my intention. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Is there a second? Second. 
Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Before I open it up to uh, the public for public comment, is there any further board discussion? Hearing none, I'm gonna open it up for the public for any public comment. So I'm not seeing any hands raised and I'm not hearing any public comment. So again, I will throw it back to the board for any additional uh, comments. And hearing none, um, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, please signify by saying nay. But the record shows unanimous decision. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Okay, next we're gonna to turn to the fiscal year 22 accountable care organization guidance. And I'm gonna turn the meeting over to Marissa Melamed and Sarah Tewksbury. Marissa, Sarah. Hi, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and board members. This is Marissa Melamed, Healthcare Policy Associate Director and Administrator of the um, ACO budget and certification process. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, I do have with me um, the full uh, ACO oversight team. I'm going to run through the slides, um, but if um, there are any specific questions that can be answered by others, I will um, call on them. And I always just like to check that you can see the slides. We can, yes. Great. All right, so here's the agenda for today. I'm going to continue the discussion from June 9th where we reviewed the guidance. Um, there was some board member discussion. We have some recommended changes. Um, I will uh, also go over any public comment received um, and then um, walk through those, walk through the changes, um, review the timeline, allow for additional questions and comments, um, and a vote was noticed for today. If um, the board is ready to do that. So the materials are all posted on the Green Mountain Care Board website. They include the certification eligibility form and attachments. Uh, the FY22 budget guidance attachments and appendices uh, workbooks. The workbooks are split into two. Um, one is specific to financial, the other is all of their sections. Um, also, after our discussion on June 9th, um, we were able to publish the first version of the uh, One Care Vermont ACO FY21 reporting manual. Um, and I hope that this is helpful to board members and the public to see the different types of reports that are collected um, and reviewed throughout the year um, to show what type of data and information that we get um, ongoing throughout the year. Um, so that we can really keep the budget guidance streamlined to um, building blocks and assumptions around the submitted budget. So I, I will address um, some things that came up around the reporting manual during today's discussion and encourage um, people who have not seen that yet to review it. Um, I'll make a note that that is a constantly um, sort of changing living document. Um, there are about 33 um, named reports in there. Um, as they come due, we do review them. Uh, internally and with One Care and others to make sure that we're collecting the information um, the way that we want it. So we will update um, that reporting manual if those templates change. Um, but we were able to get it up there in as complete a version as we could for now. There's some TBDs and, and under development on there, but hopefully it's helpful for people to be able to see what's in there. Um, again, the documents that are posted today have tracked changes just to show you the process that we went through since June 9th. Um, today's slides are only going to review the changes that we've made since June 9th. Um, and then when we it's complete and the board um, votes, we will uh, resolve and, and clean up all those changes and post the final uh, guidance documents. So we did have a public comment period that ran from June 9th when we presented the first draft uh, to June 16th. So we would have time to review and incorporate any comments. Um, we did receive five comments related to the ACO during that period. 
um, but they weren't necessarily specific to the budget guidance. As Susan mentioned this morning, um, we have some um, concurrent public comment periods that are going on, um, as well as some media coverage that we, we think um, brought in some of these comments. They, we do consider them part comments as part of this process because they came in under this process, um, but they weren't necessarily specific or all necessarily specific to the guidance. Um, the, they are posted on our website for anyone to review. Um, the themes and highlights from those comments, um, there was one that was specific to the guidance. It was a question about the threshold for an ACO's probable violation of law reporting requirements. We did review that comment um, to, to make sure that we were um, covering that concern and determined that it is covered through our certification eligibility process as is. Um, the, uh, let's say a quick word about that. Um, the role for the, the, the Green Mountain Care Board's role for certification there um, is confirming that One Care has such a plan. And so we monitor that through collection and review of the compliance plan, um, quarterly reporting and complaint and grievance reporting. So um, we appreciate that comment. Um, just to give us, a, you know, we took the time to take a little extra review there. Other comments um, uh, were um, regarding um, One Care's role in the all payer model or questions about One Care's value to the public. Um, and we did, um, we, we do um, review those comments and consider them as part of um, the, the ongoing special comment period around um, renegotiation of the model, and those are shared uh, as well with um, internal signatories. <clears throat> so I don't need to walk through each one of these slides. These are just um, bringing, bringing back what we went through last week. This is the, um, the contents of the certification eligibility verification. Um, there were no, there was no, um, changes or discussion to the certification eligibility form for FY22. Um, so there are no changes there and staff consider this ready to be uh, finalized. This is the table of contents for the ACO budget guidance. Um, there were no changes since June 9th to the introduction and updated language around COVID-19. Um, section one, ACO information and background executive summary. Um, there are no changes uh, since the June 9th discussion in this section either. Um, section two, this is an overview of what's in this section. There are some changes that I'll review with you based on the board discussion from June 9th. So we have a recommended change to question 1B and question 3E and F. Uh, in question 1B, uh, there was discussion and a suggestion from member Holmes to have the ACL quantify the number and type of providers that have dropped out of the network um, from 2020 to 2022. That would be the prior year, the current year, and the budget years. Um, and to the best of their knowledge, um, the reasons for exiting. This is information that um, the uh, one care. Um, quantifies when they give us their network um, development strategy. Um, so I think the, the ask here would be really putting that all together into the, into the budget um, submission so that we can see um, how, that, how that looked over the um, past couple of years. Um, so that seemed like a, um, a change that would be worth incorporating. In this section as well, questions uh, three, E and F. So 3E, um, the suggestion here was that the uh, strategies for reducing the administrative burden of reporting requirements um, was within uh, 3B originally under primary care. Um, Member Holmes suggested that this should be a sub-question for all provider types, not just primary care. Um, that suggestion was um, well taken, so it's its own sub-question now. And then um, the, an additional question that we added based on that discussion was description and results of outreach efforts to providers to evaluate the satisfaction that providers have with ACO's program. So we added that evaluative question um, as well. 
in the payer program section, there were no changes since the June 9th presentation. In the uh, section four total cost of care, um, we presented these two updated templates um, and we have um, a slight change to the second one. So the first one, um, uh, Appendix 4.1, total cost of care performance by payer, total ACO wide, and the narrative question on um, there are no changes to the second appendix, 4.2, settlement by payer and by HSA. Um, there were some modifications to the narrative question there, um, and they include in sub-question A, adding how is the ACO using total cost of care and quality data at the local HSA <clears throat> level to identify high value and low value care. Um, and then there was some discussion around um, C there, what evidence do you have that the ACO local accountability strategy is working? Um, the discussion was um, around really availability of data and if the um, ACO is able to, or how they're able to evaluate that at this time. Um, and after reviewing the discussion during the meeting, um, we actually recommended moving this to um, a, a new section, a new question within section seven, um, which is the population health and quality section um, to create sort of an overall um, evaluation question. Um, so when, I will review that when we get to seven. Uh, appendix 4.3. Projected and budgeted trend rates by payer programs. There were no suggested changes since June 9th. Um, as well, we discussed removal of these two appendices um, because they are either incorporated into new temp templates or the way the data is collected is no longer relevant. Um, there was no um, changes suggested since we last spoke about that. Section five on risk management, again, no changes recommended. Section six is the ACO budget financial section. Again, this is just an overview of the data that's collected and the budget narrative. Um, the financial templates are in their own workbook. They've been formatted um, and are ready um, and posted on our website. They were, there was a couple of changes that needed to be made after last meeting. Those are available for review. Um, I will note, Financial template 6.6, .6, hospital ACO participation. That is a template that we had marked under review. However, I did include it um, as it was concluded last year. Um, it was it was populated and um, I believe we can populate that as is, but um, have it on our list as one that um, we are still working on. Um, so again, there's no, no changes since we last spoke about um, section six. Section seven, the quality population health model care and community integration initiative. Um, this is where we added um, number eight there, ACO self-evaluation since our last discussion. Uh, so again, no changes since June 9th to the data that's collected within the workbook um, and no changes to these suggested. These are the um, suggested changes that we discussed June 9th, no changes since then. Um, so we added concerns and discussion for board members. We added new question seven on ACO self-evaluation. Um, and it is as follows. How is the ACO evaluating its accountability strategy and risk model at the local HSA and provider provider level level, excuse me, in your response? Discuss um, what evidence do you have that the local accountability strategy as described in section four is working and if data is not available, how does the ACO plan to evaluate it um, and um, including the evidence that you will examine and the timeline for evaluation. We also ask about how the risk management arrangements described in section five of the guidance and overall ACO accountability strategy. Um, uh, how do they support the overall accountability strategy to increase high value care and eliminate low value care? Please discuss both. And I guess, again, this is an effort to um, get the ACO to discuss um, evaluation of these sort of um, you know big concepts that we've been discussing through um, when we had Michael Bailett here and as well what you heard from um, Eric Shell this morning. 
and how is the ACO using its prior performance to improve program development? Um, so this is our recommended question to address uh, some of the discussion that was raised on June 9th. Section eight, uh, other Vermont all payer ACO model questions. There are no changes since the June 9th discussion. And again, these are just other parts of the budget, ACO budget target. Um, there's no questions here, no changes. Um, these are the same slides you saw two weeks ago. Revised budget um, guidance here is the same. And then the monitoring plan, uh, again, as I mentioned in the beginning, the reporting manual has been posted to our website for oh. review. Um, and it's, it's a work in progress as reports, as reports uh, come due. Uh, that concludes the review of the guidance changes. Just a reminder of the timeline. Um, there's a potential board vote if you're ready to do so. We issue the guidance by July 1. Um, once it's voted on, it really is just a matter of we have to um, clean it up and prepare it for posting. So it can be done before July 1 if it's ready to go. Um, and the following uh, dates we've reviewed several times with you before. I don't think I need to go through all of those. And um, that brings me to uh, board questions and comment. Thank you very much, Marissa. I'm going to open it up to the board for any questions yeah. or comments. Robin? This, yeah, I have a question actually for um, Mike Barber um, relating to the template that's still that's under review. Um, so if we approve it in its current form, I would assume that if there are changes made, it would need to come back to the full board to be the change for the changes to be voted on. Is that what do you, I, I just want to confirm that with Mike? Yeah, this is Mike. Uh, I would agree unless that um, is delegated to staff or something else. Great. Um, Marissa, could you just remind me what change it, what the review you're doing on that template entails so that we can have some understanding and to determine if it's appropriate to delegate? Yeah, it's um, let me just I'm going to pull it. I'm going to not share it because that didn't go so well last time I crashed my computer, but I'm just going to look at it since I can um, speak to it. So this template um, is hospital participation. Um, it's the summary of all hospitals and then each individual hospital has a tab where they um, divide out by payer um, the uh, home hospital spend, um, fixed perspective payments, their dues, and then um, the types of payments um, that they're like the types of payments that they're getting under each program. And I, I, my understanding is that the review of part there, this is something that um, we started reviewing and then um, just to be frank, ran out of time. Um, we're reviewing the, um, the, the sort of accounts or the different types of payments and how those, like what those remittances look like to the hospital and such to make sure that they, that we're in alignment there. Um, so I, I mean, I, I do think it could be delegated to staff. Um, that's your choice or I'd be, we're happy to bring it back. Um, again, this is a kind of a collaborative process between us and hospital budgets to understand if the way we're collecting this sort of matches the way the ACO gives it to us and the way the hospitals have it on their books. And it's been filled out in the past the way it is, um, but my understanding is that it needed to be reviewed. Thank you. Um, so what I, uh, I'm just on that topic, uh, so based on what, um what you just said marissa i i would be comfortable um delegating that to staff or to kevin um for approval so that if people would feel more comfortable and then if kevin felt like it was a big enough change to bring it back then he could obviously elect to do so but um it seems like it's it's pretty um to me, it sounded like it's pretty much lining it up so that we're getting the right information in the right form, which I'm totally comfortable with not getting a second crack at the apple there. 
OK, other board members. No, I guess I would just say thank you to Marissa and the team there for incorporating the comments that I made at the last meeting. I like the, uh, you know, the changes and I'm very comfortable with this document. OK, anything else from the board? Hearing none, I'm going to open it up for public comment on the 22 uh, guidance for accountable care organizations. Hearing none, um, Robin, are you prepared to make a motion? I am. Um, so I move that we uh, that the board approves the fiscal year 22 certification eligibility verification form as presented on June 9th and the fiscal year 22 ACO budget guidance with the staff recommended changes presented today and that we delegate uh, final review of the template that is under review to the chair. I'll second. OK, it's been moved and seconded. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion carried unanimously. Thank you, Marissa. I know that this, this has been a ton of work and uh, you've done exceptional uh, work as always. So thank you. Thank you very so much. With we'll that, get that finalized and posted as soon as possible. Super. So the next item on the agenda is going to be a discussion of a request for a waiver from Rule 5. And I just want to uh, reiterate again, as I said this morning, that there is a public comment period open on our website for any member of the public who wishes to um, offer um, any uh, comments before we vote, um, which could occur at uh, next week's board meeting. So with that, I'm going to actually turn it over to Russ McCracken from our legal team to tee up this discussion. Russ? Great, thank you, um, <clears throat> Chair Mellon. I'll, I'll keep this uh, a quick and Marissa, if you could stop sharing your screen, yeah. it would be great. <laughs> uh, great. Well, I'll, I'll get started anyhow. Um, <clears throat> Clover Health reached out to us. They're participating as a direct contracting entity in the new um, CMS direct contracting model, uh, which kicked off its first performance year this year. Um, Clover Health is coming to the board requesting a waiver of the board rule 5.4. Uh, regarding annual budget review and approval and rule 5.5 regarding uh, monitoring and enforcement. <clears throat> um, Chair Mullen, as you, as you noted, there'll be opportunity for public comment today and then uh, we also have a comment period open uh, through the 29th with a potential vote noticed for next meeting on the 30th. And uh, with that, I'd, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Kevin Murphy, who's the Direct Contracting Executive Officer from Clover uh, Health, joining us today, and David Alt, uh, Counsel at Fager Drinker, um, also joining us. Great. Th thank you. Thank you, Russ. Um, and Chair Mullen, this is Dave Alt. Uh, can you hear me? And at the same time, I am uh, sharing our presentation with you. So are you able to both hear me and uh, see we the can presentation? Hear you, we can see you and we can see the presentation. So you're successful on all three counts. <laughs> wow, I think I should quit while I'm ahead then. Um, <laughs> uh, so I brief introduction, I'm Dave Alt. I'm outside counsel um, with Fagery Drinker and I've just been helping Clover Health with some of their direct contracting um, matters, in, including this one. And uh, as Russ said, we have Kevin Murphy, who is the chief executive um, for their direct contracting entity uh, with us here today. So I think we'll start by um, allowing Kevin to just provide you all with a little bit of background on, on Clover and on its direct contracting entity, um, on its sort of mission and its goals in particular as they relate to um, its presence in Vermont uh, through this model. Um, and then I'm happy to talk a little bit about, more specifically about you know, the, the waivers um, and, and the waiver request 
So um, with, with that, I'll hand it over to Kevin, but please feel free to, to jump in at any point with questions and we'll certainly take any questions and uh, comments at the end as well. Um, and, uh, thanks, Dave, and, and, and thank you everyone for taking the time today to allow us to present. Um, so uh, Dave, if you'll go to the next slide, I'll just uh, give a, a quick overview of um, what we're gonna review today. So as Dave mentioned, um, my name is Kevin Murphy. I'm the executive director of our direct contracting entity. Uh, this program, uh, along with CMS's other direct contracting entities, went live April 1st of this year. Um, we are participating in a number of states, uh, including Vermont. Um, and so I will give you a, a quick overview of Clover Health. Um, as Dave mentioned, I'll, I'll give you an overview of our direct contracting entity and what our goals are along with how we believe that they fit uh, within CMS's goals as well as uh, Vermont's uh, model of care. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about our technology and how we believe that technology allows us to scale our model uh, in other markets as well as Vermont. Um, and then how we feel we align with the Vermont blueprint. Um, and then as Dave mentioned, he'll uh, kind of walk through the waiver requests that we uh, that we're asking for. Um, so Dave, uh, we'll start with the next slide. If you could just um, kind of this is a short video uh, that will give you a quick overview of Clover Health. Um, the audio's not playing, Dave. You're not hearing the audio. No. That's interesting. Okay, it was playing for us yesterday when we tested this with Abigail. Um, let me um, try one more time here. And otherwise, Kevin, I'll just let leave you to give a little bit more of this background. Um, so let me try one more time here. Any luck hearing it now? No, that's right. I, I, I'll, okay. I can, um, I'll, I'll walk through. So, um, so Clover Health, our, our, our overall mission is to improve every life. Um, and our, our strategy to do that is centered around deploying technology um, such as the Clover Assistant, which I'll, I'll walk through uh, later in the presentation, uh, to physicians to improve and reduce variability um, in their clinical decision making. So this is a tool um, that we uh, deliver to providers at the point of care. Uh, our thesis is that Clover Assistant powered physicians um, drive incremental value and economic value, um, supporting our ability to offer consumers wider choice um, in healthcare coverage within our MA plan, but then also in programs like direct contracting, allowing us to drive lower costs and expense and improve outcomes for patients. Um, we believe our platform reduces costs and improve outcomes um, across a variety of different programs, whether that's Medicare Advantage uh, or in a fee-for-service program uh, like uh, direct contracting. Um, so, you know, in summary, you know, our uh, approach is to deliver um, Clover Assistant to providers to use at the point of care, um, scale Clover Assistant within the marketplace, drive more value through Clover Assistant, and then give a meaningful amount of that value back to patients, providers, uh, and the government. Uh, and then obviously keep repeating those steps. Um, so Dave, if you, um, that's a kind of a general overview of uh, Clover and our ethos. Um, if we go to direct contracting, um, yeah, that's great, Dave. So those of you who may not be familiar with direct contracting, it, it really functions very much like an ACO um, with a higher degree of risk. Um, so direct contracting is part of CMS's strategy to use the redesign of primary care um, to drive broader delivery system reform improve health and reduce costs. Um, we support and, and, and reinforce the primary care physician uh, to uh, drive better care. Uh, we do this through uh, the benefit enhancements, our Clover Assistant technology. Um, and then, you know, we hope to uh, lower costs 
um, and improve uh, beneficiary protection you know, within the program. Um, CMS offers a number of benefit enhancements um, in payment rule waivers with this program, um, including those listed on the screen, the three-day SNF rule waiver, telehealth expansion, uh, post-discharge home visits, uh, care management home visits, um, and then also the provision of home health services uh, to beneficiaries who don't necessarily uh, meet the homebound criteria. Um, we feel that this aligns uh, very well for, with Vermont's efforts um, to incentivize health, uh, care value and quality um, designed to control the rate of uh, growth in healthcare costs and maintain healthcare uh, quality in Vermont. Um, next slide, Dave. And so um, today, as I mentioned, we are operating in eight states as a direct contracting entity. Um, Arizona, Kansas, Texas, Georgia, uh, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, and, and obviously Vermont, which is what brings us here today. Um, in Vermont specifically, um, we have 20 providers that are participating uh, with our direct contracting entity. Uh, they have roughly 1,883 uh, aligned beneficiaries today um, in 2021 in our program. Um, we're working to expand that effort. Um, our direct contracting agreement runs through 2026. Um, so each year we hope to expand that. Um, we, don't, uh, we will submit uh, in September to CMS um, our list for 2022 of uh, new participant providers um, that will be part of our network um, and hope to include uh, practices in uh, Vermont on that 2022 submission. Um, next slide, Dave. Before you go to the next slide, is are those yeah. 20 providers strictly limited to the Evergreen practice? Yeah, they are. Uh, great question, Kevin. Um, yeah, they're all aligned with um, the Evergreen practice um, um, and I believe there's a couple of other practices that they acquired, but they are all operating under that evergreen tin. And will you be giving us, uh, you know, what your future plans are for expanding that uh, footprint? Yeah, so, um, I mean, we are, um, you know, we're, we're currently, the, the way the process works is we um, have to go out and contract with both participant and preferred providers in the marketplace. Um, and we're in discussions with uh, independent practices as large as well as um, other ACOs that include providers in Vermont. Um, but our final submission and approval for that will not happen until September 10th. Um, so I really, we, we, we do have plans to expand there, um, but I won't be able to give you formal numbers for that expansion until CMS approves them uh, in September. Um, and then uh, next next uh, slide, thanks, Dave. So um, as I mentioned, you know, under this program, um, there is you know a provision for both participant and preferred providers. Um, participant providers are primarily primary care physicians who can align beneficiaries to the program. And then preferred providers um, are specialists, facilities, uh, ancillary service providers um, that can help support the complex or the care model um, in the program in a given market or for the direct contracting entity as a whole. Um, we work with that network of providers um, to collaborate and coordinate care um, and drive, you know, all of that uh, through our information sharing with Clover Assistant um, with a goal of, you know, assisting our providers really in all markets um, to improve care uh, coordination, um, collaborate more, um, and then, you know, as a result, you know, improve outcomes um, for those uh, patients that are aligned to the direct contracting entity. Um, next slide, Dave. Yeah, you can skip down. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you a quick walk through Clover Assistant. As I mentioned, 
that is kind of the backbone of, of our model and, and how we coordinate care amongst both our participant and preferred providers within, um, within a marketplace and within our DCE. Um, so first of all, Clover Assistant um, it is not, you know, is not really a population health tool. Um, Clover Assistant is a tool that is going to aggregate data from a variety of different resources, and it's going to submit to the provider, um, whether they're a participant or preferred provider, customized information for that member at the point of care. Um, so it's very specific to that patient on that date, you know, at that visit. Um, it's not an electronic health record. Um, you know, it, it's built, you know, to support a provider's um, care um, at the point of care, but it's not, it's not a practice management system. Um, it, it's user-friendly, it's very intuitive, um, and it only requires a few minutes of use uh, for each visit. Um, we do not uh, pay for outcomes. Um, we have a, a financial model for our participating pr practices uh, that compensates them uh, the same um, for their performance, um, whether they agree with the information we surface to them um, or disagree with that information. Um, the uh, next slide, Dave. And so um, just to give you kind of um, an overview of what Clover Assistant does. Um, so we aggregate data, you know, from a variety of different resources. So first of all, we get three years of claims history from CMS on every beneficiary uh, aligned to our direct contracting entity. Um, we also align in each market with um, um, the Health Information Exchange to get data on ADT feeds, admit, discharge, and transfer. We get overnight uh, feeds from Quest and LabCorp on labs. We get pharmacy data, um, and we also extract data, CCDA data, directly from our participating practices, uh, EMR. Um, we collect all of that data. Uh, aggregate that data, then synthesize it to identify actionable insights that we believe will benefit the provider at the point of care. Um, and I really, you know, kind of put those uh, actionable insights into, you know, four different buckets. You know, one is, you know, helping the provider um, manage complex care patients. So identifying high risk patients with multiple comorbidities and um, additional services that they may benefit from, whether they're benefit enhancements that CMS uh, is providing or additional supports and services that Clover Health Partners is providing to that provider. Um, secondly, um, you know, there is uh, also the ability to um, uh, allow the providers and, and encourage the providers to accurately um, diagnose, um, you know, the complications of the member um, at the point of care. Um, then there is also clinical recommendations, which can fall into a number of different categories. Um, but, you know, uh, alerting the provider that perhaps a patient um, is not filling the subscriptions that are being prescribed for them, um, or that there is a lapse in their fills between prescriptions and then recommending perhaps that they prescribe a 90-day or 100-day script, um, or encouraging um, specific uh, medications, um, you know, high-intensity statins uh, where appropriate. Um, and then and lastly, there's a uh, referral management mechanism, you know, within Clover Assistant that, you know, not only makes recommendation to high quality um, providers within the network, um, but will also look at the existing um, providers that a participant provider of ours is using and really recommend which of those providers um, 
have the best cost and quality uh, outcomes. Um, so those are really, you know, the actionable insights that we surface um, to a provider um, at the point of care. Um, so just in aligning with the Vermont uh, blueprint, um, you know, one of the things that is, um, you know, very important to Clover um, and very important to our direct contracting entity, and really uh, my background is in uh, house call medicine. I used to run the largest house call uh, practice in the country. And we really um, see in-home care is our differentiator um, in our, our direct contracting entity in all markets as well as Vermont. Um, and we really use in-home care um, to improve access to care for um, a patient population that typically is suffering um, from multiple cor comorbidities, um, you know, they, they have a very high frailty index um, or are frequently uh, admitting to the ER in the hospital. Um, so we've used this program within our Medicare Advantage uh, program, um, and we've been very successful um, in reducing uh, hospitalizations, uh, providing for more uh, days at home for these patients, um, improving our quality measures, um, and then of course, improving outcomes and reducing costs. Um, so providing in-home care, and, and, and in-home care, um, you know, doesn't necessarily just mean doctors and nurse practitioners going into the home. It, it also means social workers uh, working um, to identify social determinants of health and other, um, you know, things that we can do to serve this patient population. Um, and we're planning now um, and are in the process of scaling our in-home capabilities um, in all of our DCE markets. Um, next slide, Dave. And so, um, you know, so, um, you know, we're obviously through, through our programs, both Clover Assist and our complex care programs, you know, we're, we're looking to um, drive uh, better care at lower costs and align not only with CMS's goals, but obviously with uh, the Vermont goals as well. Um, we do this, you know, through creating, you know, what we call a medical neighborhood within Clover Assistant, and providing that referral support to our providers um, of those providers in the community that we feel provide, you know, the best quality um, and cost uh, outcomes. Um, we do have the ability through this program um, to negotiate uh, discounted uh, cost of care with preferred providers. Um, and we obviously use Clover Assistant to support that. Um, and then we look to, you know, drive our complex care programs um, um, to um, deliver in-home primary and collaborative care, home health. We do um, partner with home health agencies and hospice and palliative care agencies in all of our communities as well. Um, and uh, through that, develop a very strong transitional care uh, program as well. Um, next slide. Yeah. So, um, you know, and obviously we feel that this aligns with, you know, much of the theme of, of Vermont's blueprint, um, where we're, we're hoping to, um, you know, connect Vermonters um, with whole person care um, and, and really make that care accessible, you know, um, where the patient is and, and meet them where they um, feel that they can best receive that care. Um, you know, we, we do that through the development of, you know, patient-centered uh, uh, team-based care model with our in-home care. Um, all of our practices, including Evergreen, you know, have not only agreed to use Clover Assistant at the point of care, but they've, allow, they've also agreed to allow us to co-manage um, their high-risk pa patient population. Um, so, you know, we bring in those in-home care programs, we create, you know, a team-based care model, and we collaborate with uh, Evergreen and, and other practices that might come in the future 
on supporting uh, that care for those services. And then we, you know, we develop, um, you know, a number of, you know, high intensity, um, you know, support services for uh, patients, you know, in their home um, to help support uh, those needs. And then uh, next slide, Dave. And then, you know, again, this is a lot of this is driven through uh, Clover Assistant. So, you know, we support and, and will support our pra all of our practices, including Evergreen and other uh, future uh, Vermont practices um, with um, technology and resources. Um, we, we connect them, they're both the patients and the providers with community resources. And I think it's important, obviously these patients remain Medicare fee-for-service patients. So both the provider and the patients have the choice to select any provider that is a Medicare approved provider. We're just making uh, recommendations to both the provider and the patient. Um, we work to improve their access uh, to care um, and support um, any additional services that they may need. Um, and we do this all, you know, obviously to improve outcomes and reduce uh, healthcare costs. Um, and, and, you know, we, we do deliver um, analytics. Um, we do all of the back office, you know, population health to identify high risk members. We surface them through Clover Assistant to our practices. Uh, to get their approval um, and their clinical recommendations on whether or not they agree that this patient could use additional benefits provided by CMS or services provided by uh, Clover Health Partners. Um, and we share that information with the provider, you know, hopefully to help them improve outcomes. Um, so I, I think, I know I kind of went through that um, rather quickly. I think Perhaps, Dave, I don't know if it, it's best that maybe we, before we jump to the waiver request, that maybe we open up for questions, or do you want to go to the waiver request first? No, I think no, that's great. That's great. Okay, so um, the way it works in Vermont, just so you both know, um, in addition to um, any board uh, questions or comments, at some point we open it up to the uh, public for any questions or comments. So um, it, it might make more sense, Dave, if you just kept going and then we could do everything all at once. Sure, that's fine with me. Um, that, 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 that sounds just great. And, you know, as I'm, thank you, Kevin, as I'm hearing Kevin talk about, you know, the, the blueprint in, in Vermont's plan for healthcare, um, you know, the, of course the blueprint falls within CMS's uh, healthcare payment learning and action network, the LAN uh, framework for moving away from fee-for-service uh, reimbursement. And so this is, you know, just the same way that the that OneCare Vermont does with the Vermont All Payer ACO. That's exactly what you know the Clover DCE and other DCEs are are doing in this model is you know just advancing additional payment and delivery system reform initiatives um, in you know to to move away from fee for service. So um, you know to that end, I think it's just another opportunity for um, for providers in Vermont and beneficiaries in Vermont who aren't already in value based care, who aren't already in a fee for service program that's you know really driving value right um to to become involved and so as you look at sort of uh addressing chronic care uh in particular for for vermonters which i believe is a you know a, a, always a a huge uh portion of medical expenditures um uh, you know I, I think that um you know clover's you know clover's goals and clover's aims will will fit very well with that um but turning specifically to to the waiver request um so as Russ said, Russ said at the beginning of, of this uh, portion of the meeting, uh, you know, we are seeking a waiver for two of the GMCB rules, uh, rules 5.400 and 5.500. Um, and you know, we are requesting that under rule 5.601, um, which allows you as the board uh, to waive any provision of rule five um, for unnecessary hardship, uh, delay for other good cause. And so in particular, as it relates to Clover, um, you know, we think the two that are really relevant to the situation here with the direct contracting model are the unnecessary hardship and, and the, just for other good cause, um, 
the unnecessary hardship uh, because, and I'll get more into this, of course, but unnecessary hardship because this is already information that is being um, provided by Clover to CMS, that's being monitored by CMS as, you know, Medicare remains the payer here, right? So Medicare is the payer. These providers are still operating and Clover is still operating within fee-for-service Medicare um, and have to meet all of the Medicare program requirements. So, um, so that's the hardship piece. And then, you know, for other good cause, um, you know, I, you know, I, I, again, it's the it's not just the the burden piece, but um, the the burden of reporting separately, but also the fact that this is already done. So it would just be a duplicative effort. Um, you know, looking at the, um, let me go right into actually rule five, uh, 5.400. Zero, zero. Um, you know, so this is the rule for, for budgets and payer programs. And, you know, the, the requirements of, uh, rule 5.400 are really centered around, you know, budget and the related ability, um, of an entity to successfully perform its duties, uh, in, in coordinating care and providing care. But, um, if, if you look at these tools, they really appear um, mostly focused on the governmental runs, like a, like a Vermont all-payer model or maybe uh, other all-payer models, not something that's a model or an organization such as Clover's DCE, which is specific to the Medicare space. It's, you know, it's exclusively a Medicare ACO or a Medicare direct contracting entity. And, and why that's important is because if, you know, 5.400 is really a way of documenting and um, demonstrating um, compliance with rule 5.200. So if you look at sort of the, the certificate, which are the certification requirements. So if you look at the ACO certification requirements, these kind of go hand in hand with those requirements. Um, but of course, since 5.200 doesn't apply as a Medicare only ACO, uh, as a Medicare only ACO, you know, many of the, the uh, requirements under 5.400 just are, are not relevant. And, and, and I'll get specifically to them, but the meat of 5.400 is 5.403, which, which is the part that was, I think it's 22 uh, requirements for annual reporting by an ACO. Um, and again, those, you know, th those requirements are about the business model, the prior experience, um, and um, you know, uh, the ability of the uh, DCE or ACO to uh, to provide care, to provide high quality care to Vermonters. Um, and so if you look at what CMS requires, there's actually a couple different protections that are in place that hit on all of these requirements. So first, before Clover was even accepted or allowed to participate in the program, through its application, it had to demonstrate um, very specifically, um, you know, how it performed under prior or current outcomes uh, models or outcomes contracts. It had to uh, demonstrate and show its business model for participating uh, in the direct contracting model. Uh, it had to show how it was going to fund DCE activities. So how it's going to fund the benefit enhancements or the, you know, the benefits that it's providing to beneficiaries, how it can demonstrate the way it's going to interact and contract and pay with the providers that are part of the direct contracting entity. Um, and on the care coordination, care coordination piece, so beyond the budget, it had to demonstrate using that budget, um, you know, the, the promotion of evidence-based medicine, how it was going to coordinate care and care transitions, tie in social resources, provide um, individualized care. So all of these components were part of the application up front. CMS, you know, reviews those. Um, you know, uh, collects additional information as necessary from potential DCEs and only allows DCEs to participate that have demonstrated um, th th that it can meet all of those components. And then, so of course, Clover met those and was accepted in, into the model and, and into participation. And then the second part comes with the participation agreement, which is the contract that, uh, you know, the actual formal contract between CMS and Clover for its participation. Um, and, and you may be familiar with these participation agreements from the Vermont all-payer model. They are somewhat similar. So if you're familiar with that contract, you're familiar with this contract um, in, in large part as well. Um, but that, that requires ongoing obligation to continually report on any changes to governance or organization or care strategy, care model, 
Um, and, and, and significantly, um, there also is a, a expanded requirement for a public web, website that, re, that does public reporting um, that's available to everybody. Um, Clover's is cloverhealthpartners.com. So you know, if, if you want to, to go and visit it, but this is a, um, a really valuable tool, not just for um, providers, but also for beneficiaries, because it has to be updated to always have, you know, not like the name and location, the governing body, um, the clinical leaders, um, and it also includes the lists of all of the providers. So anybody can see what that network, as if you will, is in terms of the participant providers and the preferred providers. Um, this public reporting page is also where uh, Clover is required to annually update based on his performance in the model. So you can see um, it'll be noted how it's performing financially. Um, so how, you know, is it meeting its financial benchmarks, savings and losses, um, and also quality performance. Uh, so in order to in order to stay in the model, you have to meet um, quality measures, uh, performance on quality measures. And so those are also reported uh, annually um, uh, annually on, on the public reporting website. So um, turning back now, I said I would just to the 5.403. I'm not going to go through each of the 22 for the sake of time. Happy to um, <laughs> happy to answer questions on any of the specific ones that you may have. Um, but you know, I, I, what I have hit on so far are the requirements of Clover that are already being accomplished or taken care of because of its participation in the model. You know what it's, you know what it is offering to CMS, what it's reporting publicly. The only items that are on that list of 22 that are not already being done through its participation are some of the the financial aspects of Clover itself. So. Um, if you're trying to look at differences and in, in, in where those outliers are, it's things like what are Clover's expenditures, what are its costs of operation, what are its revenues, and you know these are the kinds of things that, as I mentioned before, are really important for an ACO that has a fiduciary duty to the public, right? So if 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 it's a Vermont model and where you have to make sure that if it's publicly funded in any way or if it's using the public's money, that it's being done so in, in, in a fiscally responsible way. But in the context of a, 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 a company like Clover, you know, its internal operations in terms of um, its internal costs and expenditures are not relevant to whether it's going to be able to provide um, care that you know fits Vermont's plan within the blueprint and and also fits, of course, its its um its care management plan as as submitted and approved uh, to CMS. Um, so if I turn now to um, Rule 5.5, this is the monitoring and enforcement rule. Um, and on the monitoring enforcement rule. Um, this is, it actually looks like this rule may have been drafted very closely in conjunction with the uh, with the contracts that CMS developed for the next generation ACO model, which I think you may be familiar with as sort of the predecessor to what became the uh, Vermont all payer models participation with CMS. And so the requirements are, you know, duplicative and almost you know, verbatim. Um, and actually are, are are more broad and, and go further with respect to what CMS requires. So um, it, you know, first of all, CMS requires that um, Clover maintain all records and track everything. So it's tracking its expenditures, it's tracking its benefit enhancements to the extent that it's providing, um, you know, uh, it has an implementation plan every year that it submits to CMS, where CMS says, oh, this is how you're going to be running your model for this year. This is how your provider is going to be interacting with benefit with patients. This is how you as a direct contract entity are going to be interacting with patients. And that's been approved by CMS on an annual basis. And now they um, they do the compliance where they follow up continually to make sure that that, that is the case. So. Um, in terms of compliance, it starts with the compliance plan um, that, that is put together uh, by the direct contracting entity, so by Clover and approved by CMS. And then from then on, so from the time the model started on April 1st going forward, there's claims analysis, documentation requests, interviews. So CMS is constantly reaching out, not just to the direct contracting entity, but 
to the providers that are participating with it, um, to beneficiaries, um, to, to collect information to make sure that it is in compliance. Um, every direct contracting entity, so Clover has to have a written agreement with each of its providers. So with its Vermont providers, uh, CMS looks at that agreement to make sure that that agreement itself um, you know, meets model requirements, that there's no evidence in there that um, th th that there's any opportunity for a provider or for uh, Clover to do something beyond what is um, acceptable in the model. And in fact, I, those audits, I think I got an email last week, those audits have already started for, for this year for this model for the direct contracting entity. So I think those contracts, I haven't talk, talked to Clover about this, but I think those contracts are already being uh, reviewed now. And then there's ongoing audits. Um, they're looking at medical records, charts, um, all the other data that they get data from the providers too. Um, and, and they use that along with additional documentation requests to make sure um, that, that it is meeting all of its obligations. So, um, so all to say that you know, the in addition to what's already being publicly reported behind the scenes by agreeing to participate in this model, uh, Clover has agreed to open itself up and it's, and accordingly its providers that are working with it have agreed to open themselves up, their books, their people, everything to CMS. And CMS has a contractor, um, an audit contractor that does nothing but full time looking at these, you know, 50 direct contracting entities, so including Clover, um, and monitoring to make sure that, um, that that they are fully in compliance with with the model. So, um, so with that in mind, turning to the so 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 that's sort of the, the comparison of, of of why a waiver we feel is is um, appropriate and and necessary because this is already being done, um, and that to require. Um, additional reporting separate from what is being done to CMS to require a separate process for Vermont or a loan for any other state um, is is overly burdensome. So um, for one thing, the, the information that Clover submits to CMS is done through a data system that CMS has created called for innovation or they call it for I um, when they're talking about it. And that is the way that all of this documentation, a lot of these records are communicated between CMS and the direct contracting entity and Clover. So to turn around and try to create a separate process for flowing data, flowing information um, you know, to, to Vermont separately from what is already being done is a process that you know, would cause significant uh, burden on top of the audit burden and the administrative burden that the model already puts on them um, in terms of you know, the personnel required to do it, the technology required to do it, um, and so on. And you know, beyond that, because this is operating in the context of the Medicare program, so Part A and Part B of Medicare, CMS has constant access to um, not just the claims data, but it has um, it has a constant access to enforcement data. So any investig in addition to Clover's responsibility to report on things like investigations, um, that is something that internally through its through its fraud office, through its public integrity office, um, CMS is constantly tracking on. So they would be pinged if for any provider or for the direct contracting entity, if there are any investigations, if there are any, other issues that they need to be aware of. Um, and so 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 with that, I think that this additional burden is 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 just not um, not necessary for clover. Um, and 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 the final point that I'll make, and this is, you know, just goes to the sort of general idea of, of the reason for having, um, reporting requirements in general is for protection of the providers that are practicing in Vermont. It's for the protection of uh, Vermont residents to make sure that those Medicare beneficiaries are needing and receiving the care they receive. So in the direct contracting model, Clover can't do anything to you know, reduce or avoid necessary care for patients. The patients will always retain their choice to see any providers they want to see. I mean, these these are really 
central components of the model that, that remain in place and will continue to remain in place. Um, and um, you know, they can't take any action to avoid, you know, to target one set of beneficiaries or to make sure that um, they're only, you know, going to. If you talk about, uh, you know, Kevin mentioned how in the coming year or uh, over the life of the model, there may be additional providers in Vermont participating with Clover. They, that's fine, but Clover cannot do so. It's not allowed to do so and wouldn't do so in a way that only targets a certain subset of beneficiaries, whether it's you know beneficiaries that are healthier in some way or you know so you're you're not allowed to do that. And so these are sort of some of the protections and the the integrity concerns that I think that you know the the board cares about and and should care about, but that are already covered by um, by the participation in in the model. Um, so with that, I'll pause. Um, happy to take questions, Kevin and either Kevin or I are happy to take questions. Uh, for, from you all and, and from uh, the public who have joined. Looks like Kevin just left the meeting instead of uh, hitting himself off mute. <laughs> okay. So leaving the meeting. Oh, I'm sure he'll be back. Yeah, I, I saw it go leave the meeting. While we wait for a moment, would it be helpful for me to, for now, to keep these slides up on the screen, or would you prefer for this discussion portion uh, for me to stop sharing so that you can see uh, everybody's faces instead? I'm okay with stop sharing, I, but does anyone else want to see? Yeah, this? yeah, yeah. Um, that makes sense. You can always bring them back up if needed. Um, Great. I can start with. A I'm questions. just coming back online. Yeah. My computer just uh, went crazy. Did everybody else's uh, <laughs> stay through that process? No, yes. we were. Yes. We were fine. You thought maybe you hit the leave button instead of the unmute. No, uh, the computer just started making this uh, god awful noise, and uh, everything went dead on my end. So I, I apologize. I'm but sure it wasn't back to the <laughs> So, um, Jess, did you take over in my absence? No, we knew you were coming back. We could tell it just something had a technical glitch. We just assumed you were coming back. So it was opening up to questions was sort of the next part, but we were waiting for you. Okay, great. And I had planned on uh, taking questions this afternoon in uh, the reverse order from this morning. So I'm going to start uh, with uh, Maureen first. So Maureen? Thanks. Yeah, I was starting without you <laughs> before. <laughs> Um, just a couple <laughs> questions, and you alluded to some of this. I mean, first, thank you for the presentation. And, um, you know, obviously, you do provide a lot of data to CMS. Um, but in any of the other states that you operate, do you have to do any other additional reporting requirements um, in those states? So great, great question. Uh, the answer is no. So none of the other states require um, certification and none of the other states require any supplemental um, data reporting as well. And in fact, um, beyond Clover, I've looked into to this for um, you know other organizations as well. And but you know, reaching out to about 15 to 20 states, and and none of them are requiring certification or additional data. In fact, California just last week um, came out with its um, opinion or, or its determination that. For um, for direct contracting, and he's just not going to require certification or uh, data reporting. Okay, and then the materials that you provide to CMS. I mean, is it segregated by state at all, so that if we wanted to look at uh, information just for Vermont from what you do submit? It is not segregated. Um, it the the data is for all providers and all beneficiaries. Um, you know, obviously within a data system, you know, it, the providers are identified. So is there a way that it could be segregated such that providers could be pulled out and you could try to pull claims associated with them? I mean, you know, 
again, that gets to the, the I guess, the burden part, where is it possible in a data system to pull them out? It, it may be. Uh, Kevin may be able to speak better to that than I can, um, but it would certainly require significant effort um, and, and maybe sort of development of new computer data processes to do so. And have you done any projections on, you know, opportunities for growth in Vermont and how how much that could be? Um, yeah, so I mean, we've looked at, um, you know, we, we, we have, um, you know, we, we do have all of the practices in Vermont identified and whether or not they're affiliated with other payer models. So participating in other Medicare shared savings programs or other programs. Um, and, and we are, you know, specifically talking to FQHCs and rural health clinics. Um, we have a number of rural health clinics in um, Kansas and Georgia that are participating with us. So um, we have looked at the market and identified, you know, practices that we think would be a good fit for us. Um, yes. Do you look at all to either here or any of the other states expand out of this Medicare program? Um, not, uh, not, not presently. I mean, this is really our focus right now. Okay. Um, okay. Those are all the questions I have now. I'll let everyone else ask some of the other questions. Thanks. Thank and, and Maureen, I would, sorry, just to respond a little bit to your final comment too, about expanding beyond Medicare. I, obviously, if there ever was a point that Clover, uh, decided to expand beyond just participating as a Medicare ACO, that you know, obviously, I think that would require another conversation with Vermont. So I don't think there should be any concern about that happening behind the scenes or happening. I mean, I think that this conversation and, and the request for these waivers are based on um, based on an understanding and a representation that um, Clover Health is participating only as a, a Medicare ACO or DCE, as the case may be here. Yeah, and I would think that. Um, you know, obviously, depending on what the board decides in the future on whether or not there's, you know, a waiver or not, there may be an expectation that there still would be further conversations anyway. So, oh, yeah, you know, fair, fair, fair enough. And I wasn't trying to foreclose that as well, either, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. you. Uh, Member Pelham, Tom. <clears throat> Hi there. Um, so I just want to follow up on the uh, issue of Vermont having access to CMS files uh, as they, I'm understanding that there isn't a segregated file that is just a Vermont file, but um, obviously there's correspondence and contract relationships and things of that sort between Glover and CMS. And I'm wondering uh, would we have access to that on a targeted basis? Should there be something that we want to see? So access, as, just to make sure that I'm understanding your question, Tom, um, would you have access to the um, the documents or the contracts between Clover and the providers that are operating in, in Vermont? Is, is in, in those sorts of documents, so sort of the non the non-claims non-financial documents is, am, am i understanding well, you correctly no i i guess i'm worried i'm okay let's do a worst case uh you know we hear from some vermonters who have uh been serviced by the clover assistance system that things aren't going very well and um and so and that there's some history of that and that we would want to know about that and so in a worst case if we file a freedom of information act to say let us see the pertinent materials um, associated with these uh, with this issue. Names crossed out, whatever. You know, would 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 we be able to do that? And would you have any objection to us doing that? Yes. So, um, and, and Kevin, please feel free to piggyback on on me here with your own thoughts. Um, but but two two thoughts on that. One is that there is a grievance process either for providers or for beneficiaries in place uh, through the direct contracting model. So 
every year uh, Clover has to send all of the beneficiaries a letter saying you're aligned to, you know, you are part of this direct contracting entity for this year. And if you have any questions, if you have any problems, complaints, you can reach out and, and they can contact CMS. And so CMS handles those and investigates those. Um, I actually came from the Innovation Center running the next gen model. And so I know they take those very seriously and do follow up with those. So any grievant grievances would be um, addressed as part of the model. Um, so that, that's sort of part one of my answer. And so I, I don't know that that would um, be necessary. And then that contact information is also available, of course, on the public website as well for, for uh, Clover's DCE. But the second part is, you know, I know that Clover also wants to be a, you know, a good, you know, a good partner with, with Vermont and, and, and be a, you know, a positive presence to, you know, to patients and, and, and to the state. And so, you know, to, to that end, I think that, you know, I, the Clover was certainly open to, you know, helping you all in any way that doesn't create a you know, significant, uh, you know, ongoing burden uh, for for the organization. So some tactical burden uh, in a few instances you might be open to as part of a waiver. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I, Kevin speaks to that, but I think that sounds reasonable. I think that part of the you know, this burden comes from the annual reporting requirement of, you know, this and, and being a so this isn't an open ended forever kind of a thing anyway. So this model is a roughly five ish, five plus year model. And so the the likelihood of things changing significantly over those five years are are not significant. And, and so requiring that annual process, um, you know, there probably wouldn't be, you know, much information that would even change for, from year to year, and do, if any, uh, from doing so. So how, how uh, old is the Glover Assistant system? How long has yep. it been around and active? Yeah, so it's been, um, it, it's been around and active, I would say, for um, for three years. Um, it, it's been used within our Medicare Advantage plan extensively the last two years, um, and this year in direct contracting and Medicare Advantage. Right. And so it's, its implementation has been rolled out a few times, more than once. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. So we, um, so we, we have about, you know, roughly 60,000 Medicare Advantage lives. Um, about 60% um, of the patients in our Medicare Advantage plan were seen using Clover Assistant last year. So roughly 36,000 lives. So where, um, where has the rollout been the most problematic? Um, where has the rollout been most problematic? But I mean, I, I think, um, um, you know, look at, I, I, I mean, you know, so Clover Assistant has a, is a tool for the provider and not necessarily the patient. Uh, I understand that. I understand so, that. Um, so Clover Assistant has a net promoter score in the high 50s, low 60s. Um, if you were to compare that with any EMR, it's not an EMR, but that would be the most uh, relevant, you know, system to compare it to. They're typically in the single digits, sometimes negative. Um, so uh, I, I wouldn't uh, hold up the EMRs as a point of comparison. No, I, I, that, that's my point. I mean, so it's hard for me to say um, where is the most providers um, that are using the tool, you know, like the tool because it provides them with information that they normally don't have access to. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, it's hard for me to say where, where where has it been problematic. I mean, it's really, where it's problematic is if a provider doesn't feel that the extra two minutes that they have to spend with Clover Assistant are worth their time, you know, during a visit. You know, but it, that would really be where it's problematic. Does a provider want access to that information? And are they willing to spend a couple of extra minutes per visit to access it? But there's been no problematic 
technical problems with the system. No. Systematic no. problem, you know, with the system. No. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, Member Lunge, Robin. Thank you, and thank you both for being here today. Um, so I did go and look at your website, and I'm, it's because your performance year just started this year. Of course, you don't have financial and quality performance data up, but I'm wondering when you would expect that to be posted for the 2021 uh, performance year. Yeah, so we won't receive that data until July of 2022 from CMS. And I'm assuming that that data will be aggregated and not necessarily broken out by state. That's correct. Okay. Um, so, yeah, and and so the reason the the CMS allows for a three month claims run out before sure, they sort yeah. of wrap up the year. So yeah. So anyway, so that's why there's a bit of a delay in publishing it. Yeah, we're very familiar with that since we do our own reporting to CMS under the Alpair model. So yep. <laughs> uh, the so in terms of the benefit enhancements, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how those are implemented in your model, because I it well, in particular, currently with just one practice and no preferred providers, at least according to your website in Vermont, like how do you actually implement that benefit enhancement? Or is that something that would be implemented not this year for any Vermonters, given that uh, it's one practice? Yeah, so I, I can give you the answer to both questions. So specific to Vermonters, I mean, we, we are um, actually working with a, a couple of different preferred providers we can add at any point in time during the year. So yeah. we're actually working with a couple of different preferred providers that we would expect to add this year for Vermont. Um, okay. uh, um, and those would primarily be home health, um, palliative care, hospice, skilled nursing, um, you know, entities uh, like that. Um, and then how we how we execute, um, you know, we, we, we you know, we had to submit an implementation plan to um, to Clover for or I mean to CMS for each one of those benefit enhancements. Sure, um, so as, as did we for our model. Yep, so I'll just pick one as an example. So for like, if we were to take um, the post-discharge visit as, as an example, if we got an ADT feed that indicated that someone had admitted, you know, and was discharging, um, we would alert the provider as well as a preferred partner in the marketplace. So if we have a home health agency or a in-home care um, service in the market, we would notify all three of them that that individual had discharged. And if we believed that they were high risk and at risk for readmission, we would request that first, you know, Evergreen, you know, see the patient within 48 hours. If they were not able to see them within 48 hours, we would ask their permission to have either our home health partner or in-home care partner to see that patient in the, in the home. Um, once they see the patient in the home, they would then assess the need to continue with a recommendation for follow-up in-home care visits. And that post-discharge benefit enhancement allows for up to nine visits in the home within 90 days. So let's say it was a home health agency, they would make the recommendation, this patient needs two, three or four visits. Um, they would submit that recommendation to Clover. We would review and approve that recommendation. Um, and then you know, the appropriate level of provider would you know, serve that. We have to document all of that and be able to provide, um, you know, that information back to CMS. But the entire process, you know, right. the review, the approval, and the uh, actual visits. Great, thank you. Um, that's very helpful. I was trying to get sort of a very practical understanding of how that works in your model. Um, similarly, in terms of your in-home care model, um, uh, who would actually provide that care? Like a preferred provider in state 
or yes. ever? Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, right. And let me, I, I just want to be very specific. So, you know, our, our approach is, um, is to support our providers that are part of the network. So, you know, if Evergreen had a very robust in-home care program and social workers, and, you know, so we surface the need that we mm-hmm. believe exists within Clover Assistant. Victoria Loner. If, if, that, if that practice is capable of fulfilling that need by themselves, then they, of course, will do that. We just want to make sure that somebody does it. If they're not able to do that, then the intent is that we have supplemental resources that will provide that uh, or fill that need. But are those supplemental resources existing Vermont providers or are they other providers that you would bring in from another state or would it be somebody through telehealth? That's what I'm trying to understand. Oh, yeah. So, well, it, it's a, it would be, a, it's a combination. So, um, they're obviously licensed within the state, whoever sure. is providing the care. Um, and depending on what the exact need is, um, you know, it, it will either be um, an in-home resource. Typically, there's always a local resource that is part of that model. Um, but in some instances, it could include telehealth. You okay. know, where, where perhaps a nurse is going in or a social worker is going in, but a provider uh, may be telehealthing in with that visit. Got it. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, I had my next question was around um, in your March 11th letter from Mr. Alt, you indicated that you might be developing a shared savings program. It sounded like that would happen in performance year one, but could you speak a little bit more to that and then um, connect the dots with me for from your slide indicating that you're paying for the use of the product and not for outcomes? How do those two fit together? Yeah, so on the shared savings model, we we are we we have not finalized the shared savings model for 2021. We do intend to. Our, our challenge is we have a we have a, a large variety of different practices that are participating. We have like an Optum practice um, that has a couple of hundred providers and you know 20,000 patients, and then we have solo practitioners that might only have 50 or 100 patients. So we're trying to develop a model that is um, you know, fair um, to everyone. Our intent is that we share you know, up to 50% of the savings with our, um, with our um, participant providers. Yeah. Um, and and we've, we've, uh, in, in our agreements with them, we've committed to doing that, submitting and developing a plan this year Uh, that would be effective for this year. Um, With regards to Clover Assistant, we do pay our providers. We pay the way we've structured our direct contracting entity is that they receive 100% of Medicare allowable. They're still submitting all of their claims to CMS, and CMS is still adjudicating all of their claims, but Clover is paying whatever CMS adjudicates. So we're still, you know, paying them 100% of Medicare allowable. In addition to paying Medicare allowable, we pay them a Clover Assistant visit fee. So we pay them a fee for using Clover Assistant at the point of care for each qualified visit, which is, you know, a, a qualified E&M visit. Um, so, um, and that the that fee ranges depending on, um, you know, the, the the structure of the organization. But for you in Vermont, it's a $45 incremental fee above and beyond what they receive for their um, uh, Medicare allowable. Um, and, and that's guaranteed upside to the practice already. Um, yeah. If, if, in the event that we did not earn savings, there is no ability to claw back those payments. Yeah. And those payments are made weekly to the practice. Uh, if they did 100 Clover Assistant visits last week, they would be paid $4,500 this week. 
Um, and, and just to, you know, so our philosophy, of course, is that by providing a primary care physician with more information at the point of care, that we will drive better outcomes. And so there is no requirement on their part to, um, if they want to get paid, they have to use Clover Assistant, but there's no requirement for them. Like if we recommend that a patient needs complex care, they don't have to agree with us. Um, right. They just have to complete the visit and acknowledge that we recommend made that recommendation. Got it. Okay, thank you. That was super helpful. Um, the reason why I was in particular interested in shared savings is that uh, with the state's agreement with CMMI, uh, we are not limited to one ACO in our model. Um, we actually, any shared savings program qualifies for both our scale and our total cost of care. So we would still be responsible for total cost of care for your pop to a population attributed to you. So, in so I, I, I think we need to have a little bit of understanding about the shared savings model when it comes to fruition, um, in order to meet our contractual obligations between the state and the feds. So, um, I. I just wanted to explain that because that may not, that's not necessarily, because it's a federal agreement, it's not necessarily laid out in the rule. Yeah, uh, makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that is all my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. Next, I'm gonna call on member Holmes, Jessica. Great, thank you very much. Um, let me just pick up on the, the shared savings questions that Robin just asked. I'm just wondering out of curiosity, why not a two-sided risk model? Uh, great question. Um, yeah, so I, I, we do, um, to be clear, we, we do have some organizations that, um, larger organizations that are participating with us that um, will have upside downside in performance year two none have it in performance year one. Um, and I, I think from our perspective, you know, obviously um, we're open to that, but the organizations that are gonna participate in downside, um, you know, puts a little bit of a burden on us because financially, you know, they would have to meet the same rigor and requirements that we would have to meet in order to take on that downside risk. Um, so, um, you know, at this time, we've really only entertained it with organizations that have had a prior downside risk arrangement with CMS. Okay. But is there a plan to potentially bring that into Vermont in year two, or are you thinking that Vermont is doesn't have the size or the experience? Or yeah, so we, 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 we would require a minimum of 5,000 members for downside risk. Um, so currently we, you know, we, we, we don't have um, someone of that size that is participating. If we did in 2022, if we signed an ACO that had prior experience, um, we, we would be open to it. Okay. And that actually leads into my next question. I think the question has sort of been asked, but I'm not sure it's been directly answered. I'm wondering if you could specifically tell me how many beneficiaries you anticipate having within the next five years in Vermont? So specifically a projection number that you're currently thinking about. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Is my legal team on here besides Dave? <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, as a public so company, I mean, I, you know, I'm uh, obviously often advised not to give forward looking numbers. Um, um, you know, so, and, 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 there, and, 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 and I'm not trying to be evasive either. I mean, there, there, there are a lot of complications with a new model like this um, that, you know, um, have caused some concerns from us. Um, you know, we, we lost a significant number of lives last year due to, you know, the fact that this is a new model and some of the reporting requirements weren't um, published appropriately by CMS. Um, and then there are also a number of entities that are in conflicting programs and don't know it. So until we submit someone to CMS and CMS approves them, you know, we're not um, very confident on like saying, hey, we're going to have 10,000 lives. 
Um, if you ask me how many I would like to have, you know, we, we'd like to have, you know, 25, 50,000 lives, you know, in Vermont over the next five years. Um, I, I can't say that we'll, you know, get to that number. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, so Clover Assistant is, is clearly the backbone of your model, right? I mean, this technology is, is what you're um, using. And I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit about uh, the evidence base that you're using in developing the algorithms there and, and the recommendations. What specifically is the evidence base that you're using? And a sub question to that would be, what are the types of clinical protocols that would not have been followed by the providers, but for Clover Assistant? What what is yeah. the actual? Give me some examples of behavioral change that Clover Assistant generates. But also, I want to know what the evidence base is too. So yeah, yeah. So let me let me. I'll, I can give you. I mean, first of all, I should have one of my medical directors, and I am not a clinician. So, um, 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 I, but I I think you know, I'll, I'll go to your second question first because I, I have the most experience with it. Um, you know, so we, we have great analytical models that, that, that identify high risk patients. And, um, you know, we, we, we use a number of different algorithms to identify those. And we have, you know, what we believe is about an 82% accuracy rate on identifying high risk complex care patients. Um, however, um, through my experience, I, you know, I know that regardless of how good an algorithm is, it's not necessarily as good as a provider that has been seeing a patient for a significant period of time's intuition um, or, or gestalt. So we surface to our providers that we believe are high risk, the surprise question. You know, would you be surprised if this patient were to pass away in the next six months? Um, that's a question that a provider typically doesn't think of. Um, if they answer that question, no, I would not be surprised, then we will offer some of the benefit enhancements that CMS provides um, or palliative care or other resources to, you know, engage with that patient. Um, you know, so th that's, you know, that's an example of something that we might surface that a provider might not typically, you know, ask of or think that question um, and, and, and seek out other resources to address that need. Um, you know, the, the algorithms, um, you know, I, I mean, a lot of what we, you know, what we, um, I mean, obviously we're looking, we really focus on in addition to Clover Assistant, we're focusing on building complex care programs and coordinated care programs that address, you know, the five to 10% of the population that is responsible for 40 to 60% of the cost and really improving access there. So a lot of the algorithms are designed to identify the need for those patients and then serve to the provider, um, not, not only the identification of the need, but the availability of resources to serve that need. Um, you know, and that's really where a lot of our, our, our focus is. There are, there, there's a million other things that my medical directors, you know, could probably go over with you, but those are the things that I focus on the most. Hi, um, I actually, this is Gia Lee and I'm joining in. I'm a uh, general counsel at Clover Health. I just wanted to add a couple of things that, you know, you might be wondering about in terms of the evidence based. Um, so um, we actually also met with the FDA about our tool um, to address any concerns that they had. Um, and one of the very important things about the tool is that we always give the basis for our recommendations. So insofar as we might suggest, um, you know, given um, the A1C levels, certain types of medications or various treatment protocols, we would have also on that same page a link to the um, recommendations from the American Academy of, you know, 
diabetes or something like that, um, or <coughs> various AMA recommendations, et cetera. So it's always supposed to be helping the doctor make their own decisions as opposed to obviously making them for them. Um, and so we will, but in any event, there are recommendations with respect to different types of um, um, medications given um, any comorbidities, um, as well as there are recommendations with respect to, for example, um, additional testing that the doctors might want to consider doing given um, if there's some lab result that um, may be indicative of some other kind of disease that may be um, you know, uh, coming into being. So those are some of the recommendations that are in there. Okay. Um, and just, you know, obviously in this day and age, big data is incredibly valuable. Um, so I'm wondering if the data that's collected in Vermont and in other states aggregated and or otherwise are uh, any plans to sell them for commercial purposes to any other entities? No, not that I'm aware of. Um, my, my last question actually involves, in the application, there was a focus on um, care redesign and specifically ensuring treatment in the most optimal setting by the right provider. So I'm wondering in the Vermont context, specifically in Vermont, what data are you using and what specific quality metrics and cost metrics are you using to define what is the most optimal setting and who is the right high quality provider in Vermont? How is that referral management um, program going to work? What data are you specifically planning to use in Vermont to identify low cost, high quality providers, optimal settings and right providers? Yep. So I, I um, so we, we, we do use, we use data from Care Journey. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Care Journey at all or not. So Care Journey, um, you know, is an organization based in, in DC that, um, you know, is headed by, you know, a former um, CMS uh, employee, I believe. But um, um, they have access to 100% Medicare data. Um, and they they do cost and quality um, ratings regionally that is driven by regional data um, on um, providers by you know um, by provider category. Um, so that's one of the resources that we use um, in, in the way that we approach it. So we look at site of care, you know, is a particular provider performing the same, um, service in a hospital setting versus an ASC setting. You know, so obviously, if they're performing the same quality of care, they're, they're equally rated on quality, but one is delivering that service in a hospital, the other is delivering it in an ASC, there's going to be a significant difference in cost. And so if a provider is currently, when we look at their past historical data, is currently using both of those, let's just say cardiologists, um, you know, to refer patients to, when we make a recommendation for a referral, we would probably list both of them, but we would list the one that is performing the service in the ASC first. Um, so, you know, um, you know, obviously, I mean, you know, referrals, um, you know, is, is obviously tricky because the patient and the provider at the end of the day have choice. We're just trying to optimize the individual provider's decision-making by giving them more information uh, than they presently have to allow them to make a better decision. That's really the, the simple approach. Okay, great, I think that's it, Kevin, from me. Thank you, Jess. So um, in your presentation today, uh, you were very careful to show alignment with the Blueprint for Health, but you didn't really show alignment with either the All-Payer Model Agreement or Act 113. Um, I, was, I was curious uh, why you chose that uh, approach. Sure. Um, 
to, to be completely candid with you is because in, in the conversations uh, with uh, the the board staff, uh, w- w- with Mike and others, they said that you were going to be particularly interested in alignment with the state's blueprint. Um, and so that that's why I, that's why I, I was uh, predominantly focused on that is, is, is I thought that's where your interest uh, lied. Happy to answer questions about other alignment with respect to, you know, Vermont all payer model. I, I think that, you know, Again, the Vermont all payer model is, is sort of one piece on your on, on the path that the blueprint lays out in terms of getting away from fee for service and, and providing high value care. So that's what the Vermont all payer model is. And again, it's from the all payer perspective and how how the Clover direct contracting entity aligns with it is it's another tool in the state. So, for instance, you know, um, if there are providers that are interested in your state and taking on more or less risk that are, you know, either new to um, value-based care and and understand the, the need to get involved but don't want to take on significant risk, or the other end, they, they feel like they are ready to take on risk, you know, Clo- Clover is able to provide, as, as Kevin described, sort of like a, a path that's sort of tailored. So it, it's just another option in terms of if there are providers in your state that are looking to get involved in value-based care, the Vermont all-payer model is, is, is a great option and, and provides a lot of opportunity. This, this is another opportunity. And so I think they work hand in hand in covering um, even more of your state in, in terms of not just providers, but in beneficiaries and in, in getting more of your patients into similar types of coordinated care, right? Where, you know, I, th- I think a lot of the the care strategies that, that Clover is employing in terms of identifying your, your high risk, your comorbid- comorbidity, identifying those patients and really making sure that they get the care they need early on to prevent, you know, further downstream care that would otherwise would be unnecessary and, right, and finding the right care at the right place. Those are the same goals. And so it's just another resource or another opportunity for those providers to come into this space. So I, I would uh, agree to, with you that uh, the goals are similar. Um, did you look at the financial targets that Vermont is committed to under the all-payer model agreement? Um, I have looked at them, yes. I don't have them in front of me at the moment. So with Medicare population, we're looking at uh, two-tenths of a percent less than the trend line of the, the national growth rate. And so um, how do we, um, as we're trying to meet our obligations with the federal government, um, know that uh, you're working in that direction and at the same time act 113 makes sure that as you've pointed out earlier that um, quality isn't diminished for vermonters so without having any of your information how do we know that we're meeting the financial targets while maintaining the quality yeah so so two different ways uh one is that you know ultimately as you know, as was pointed out, I believe by Robin, it's it's not available yet because we're just in the first performance year. But the quality information, the financial information, so the actual performance, um, you know, overall we, will will be reported. So you will see that. And um, in terms of on an ongoing basis, um, you know, the there are the four quality measures that that. Um, that are being reported on. So it's the three claims measures, measures, and then what's called the CAPS measures. So these patient survey measures, um, and and you have to maintain a high level of quality in order to uh, remain in the model. And, and and on the financial piece of it, because it's a total cost of care model, right? They um, and being responsible for the expenditures, all of the expenditures for those beneficiaries, for those Vermont patients, um, you know, that is the, right, and and being at full risk. So um, they are a global direct contracting entity at full risk. So because of that, they are going to be driven to continue to to meet those levels of savings that would, would fit with the, with the state standards. When, when you um, were discussing what your strategy should be and coming forward with a waiver, did you at all consider a different uh, request that might be um, asking for alignment with the C- CMS reporting rather than waiving reporting to the state? 
Um, yes, cer certainly considered it. Again, I think the issue with alignment with reporting is that a lot of the reporting for CMS is done through a different mechanism. So it's either done automatically. So when it comes to, you know, sort of the, the monitoring and reporting, the compliance piece, a lot of that is data that CMS already has access to. And so, right, and, or, or it's efforts that CMS is already taking or going to take anyway to reach out to the direct contracting entity or to the providers or to the beneficiaries. So it would be, so the, the, those efforts, if Vermont was doing them, would be an additional on top. And then for the other piece, the part that, um, for the information that Clover has to report separately, which is the sm probably the smaller piece, that's again being reported um, in large part through the uh, system that was created for these models by CMS. So to be able to align them and sort of just say well, everything that we're submitting to CMS will submit to you as well, uh, to Vermont as well, it's really not as easy as that. It's not just sort of clicking a button for it to go to CMS and a button for it to go to Vermont. It would really take significant operational um, person power and financial resources in order to be able to to provide even the same uh, the same information to to Vermont. Okay, um, you guys have made the news a lot lately, uh, most recently as a meme stock. But before that, um, there were also uh, other stories out there in the media. Um, the Hindenburg security fraud lawsuit, the SEC investigation. Is there anything that those 1800 Vermonters that are currently um, affiliated with you, is there anything that should concern them? Um, so I, I'll let Kevin speak to that. And if she is on and she wants to speak to that, she used to certainly time in, chime in as well. Um, you know, I, I would say no. First of all, you know, those are, you know, r r reports in the news. Um, and that, as I mentioned before, CMS continually, you know, they use the Office of the Inspector General, the Department of Justice, and their own Center for Program Integrity to constantly evaluate the participation of the direct contracting entity and its providers. And they're constantly monitoring all of these things, um, any kinds of investigations, and you know, do not allow uh, organizations to participate or to continue to participate if there is any concern for um, for the beneficiaries. And, and and that's something that I can tell you from my time at CMS is is really crucial to the to the function of the the model team that operates this this model or and any of their models, frankly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I, I would let. Gia, if you're on, you can speak to it, but I would I would echo David's comments and just say that if CMS had any concerns with Clover Health as a direct contracting entity, they wouldn't have awarded us the program. Um, they, they wouldn't have admitted us and accept us as, I mean, there's been a lot of focus also on direct contracting entities. Um, and I don't think that they would have accepted Clover if they had any concerns whatsoever. Yeah, <clears throat> just to make clear, we did <clears throat> have to submit an application and um, <clears throat> CMS has the authority at any time to revoke that if they had any concerns. Um, also, as a public company now, we have far more reporting obligations about the nature of the company um, than we did previously in any event. So, um, you know, <clears throat> we, we think that, um, you know, those we don't think that there is reason for concern along the lines that you've suggested. Thank you. Um, do other board members have any follow-up questions before I turn it over for public comment? Seeing a lot of shaking heads. I don't see Maureen, but I'm assuming that uh, you do not have anything further. So I'm going to open it up for um, public comment. Um, is there any member of the public who wishes to comment on uh, the discussion before us concerning Clover Health and a request for a waiver. And Walter, I'll call on you first. Uh, thank you, Kevin. And I wanted to, Kevin brought up most of the points I wanted to raise. So I won't repeat them about the being in the news lately. So thanks to Kevin for that. My question is, how much would this cost Vermont? Because you obviously aren't doing this for your own health care. 
who your CEO is, and why do we need something like this clove in the first place? I don't think we really need them. And how much would the data be stumbling over each other? We already have half a million data reporting agencies. And just to have another one through the technology, how much would it cross over and repeat? And how much would that cost us in the end? Um, so our, our CEO is Vivek Garapali, um, to answer that question. Um, to answer the, the data, well, let me answer the, the financial question first. There is no cost to the state, um, to us, you know, operating in the state. Um, um, there's there's no financial cost there. Um, and then with regards to the data, um, you're right, there are a lot of data resources out there. And, and that really is the purpose of Clover Assistant. We're trying to aggregate all of that data and surface it to a provider at the point of care to enable them to provide better care to a patient at the point of care. Today, within their own EMR, and, and if you're you know, at all familiar with EMRs, there's hundreds of them out there that don't talk to each other. So in Evergreen's case, they are on Athena, which is one of the, they're either on Athena or eClinical Works, but one of those two EMRs, which are you know, better EMRs when you look at the EMRs, but they don't have access, they only provide the provider with access to their own data. What we're providing them with access to is every single claim that has been filed for their patient, regardless of who the provider is. So if a, it just as an example, if a patient admits to the hospital, one of the challenges that patients often face is they're prescribed new medications when they, when they go to the hospital and then they come home and they have the existing medications that were prescribed to them before they went into the hospital. Some of those medications may contraindicate and they may be taking two medications simultaneously that they shouldn't be taking. The provider will have access to that data now because they'll have all of that information when that patient comes into the office. If a specialist, or a hospitalist or someone else prescribed the medication, that doctor will now have access to it, where before they did not have access to it. With all this managed care you're talking about, as a patient who has had claim denials and been refused access before, I wonder how much you would, ref you would re refuse access in order yeah, well, to make a profit. You have to cut that back. Yeah, Walter, that's a great question. Um, and, and one of the things that, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things that I like a, a lot about this direct contracting program, but one of them that, that I like, um, you know, uh, the most is the fact that we do not adjudicate claims. CMS is solely responsible for approving and denying claims. So if, if you were to, um, you know, receive a, a service or, or elect to have a service done, Clover has no ability whatsoever to approve or deny your ability to receive that service. Only Medicare can do that. Okay, other yeah. public comment? And I, Walter, I was just going to add on one more one more thing with respect to so if you are a Medicare or you know for any Medicare beneficiary who is in Medicare Part A um, and, and Medicare Part B, so if you're in the sort of original or traditional Medicare, this doesn't actually and it's not allowed to by law. It's not allowed by the program. It's not allowed to change the way you receive your care in terms of. Um, there can't be any limiting in terms of providers you can go to. You go to any provider you want to go to, just as as that beneficiary would now. That provider, you know, receives the same services and so on. The only, the only thing the model can do, the only thing, you know, the all payer Vermont all payer model, the only thing that the direct contracting model with Clover 
the only things they can do is perhaps offer something additional in terms of the care you receive. So providing some other benefit, at, and again, there's no cost. You're not, no beneficiary pays any more than they're already paying for Medicare, but just to help coordinate their care. And to your question about, well, you have to make money. The whole premise behind this is that if you take good care of patients, so if you get the patient the care that he or she needs when they need that care, and with the provider that's the right provider to provide that care, then they're not going to be admitted to the hospital. You know, they're not going to have all these other problems down the road that end up being really expensive and costly. So if a, if a Clover or if some other organization spends a little more money on, on you know, chronic conditions up front for patients, it actually saves money in expenditure to the end of the road. And the way it works in this program for Clover and for the others doing it is that at the end of the year, CMS looks and says, wow, Clover, you were able to prevent a lot of, you know, um, expenditures because you were taking care of patients early on and, and, and coordinating their care. And because of that, you share in the savings that the Medicare trust fund um, has. So the Medicare money, right? You share in the savings that the Medicare program saw because of the care that Clover and its providers offered. So that's the sort of the general premise as to how an organization such as Clover ma makes money in, in a model like this, or you know how they make it affordable to participate. Other public comment? Uh, yes, uh, I see Eric Schulteis from the Healthcare Advocates Office. Eric. Hi. I'm just curious, so, you know, setting the, aside the question of CMS, if whether CMS can be the perfect regulator and, you know, if, or whether we should have concerns as a state, I mean, between the volume of the SEC investigation, the DOJ investigation, the class action suit, um, your CEO's expletive laden uh, interview with Forbes, and the New Jersey legislature's call for investigation. So what has have you as an organization changed in your practices? Because we're not talking about one thing. I mean, it really is in this case where there's smoke, there's probably fire. <laughs> Kevin, do you want to start with that or would you prefer for me to? Uh, or Gia. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, I guess feel free for Gia to, to chime in. My response to that, Eric, is, you know, is that any time for, you know, for, for any business, any company, whether it's a public company or a private company, but especially, you know, one that goes public, you know, there is going to be news, there's going to be chatter, and that's why there can be investigations. And that's why, you know, um, and, and that's the reason why CMS follows a process in not just making sure before allowing a DCE to participate, so before allowing Clover to participate, that you know it, it checks again, it, it checks with the Department of Justice, with the Office of the Inspector General, and so on, and it then together they make a determination that it's okay for you know that, that Clover is 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 a company or an organization that should be able to participate, and that that isn't on, it's not a once and that's done. That is an ongoing um, process. And so, um, you know, it, it's not just, um, you know, the Innovation Center or the, you know, the, the CMMI model team is running the model, making these decisions. It's actually a much broader effort to make sure that the organizations that participate in the direct contracting model um, are, you know, are, um, are in good standing to do so. Sorry, I was hitting my unmute button and was hitting the wrong button. So, um, yeah, I would just add on to what Dave said. I mean, number one, there was that Hindenburg report to which we wrote a very lengthy response. And so I would encourage you to read that if you haven't had the opportunity yet, um, which I think, um, you know, provides our uh, view on things. Um, as well as the fact of what Dave just said, um, as he mentioned, he had worked in C, um, CMMI, as well as I was deputy general counsel of HHS. So I'm very familiar with the coordination that goes on um, between CMS, HHS, and DOJ. And so um, 
again, CMMI has, you know, there's certain programs where everyone is entitled to participate in. In this type of model, CMMI has complete discretion with respect to what um, entities it will allow to participate in the model. Um, and it has complete discretion as well to, you know, kick someone out of the model if it has any concerns at any point. So, um, you know, there's no obligation for them to um, to keep anyone in the model. There are, in fact, only 53 participants right now. Um, and so, you know, to the extent that um, CMMI has better access to speak to speak and coordinate with other agencies, um, you know, that's what we would point you to. Thank you. Okay, other public comment? Other public comment? So I can hear some somebody very inaudibly. I don't know if somebody just has background on or if they're trying to make a statement. Yeah, I think you're good now. Okay, so <laughs> I, I'm not hearing any other further public comment. Um, as we uh, spoke about uh, at the introduction to this uh, segment of our board meeting, um, this is something that could likely be voted on next week. Um, we do have a public comment period that um, is open for anybody to submit written public comments to, and that can be accessed through our website. And um, we may have some follow-up questions as we sleep on this, uh, the individual board members giving some thought to uh, um, making that decision um, possibly next week. Um, no guarantees, but possibly next week. And um, if we have those follow-up questions, is it uh, okay for us to submit them to you? And should they go through David or who? Yeah, absolutely. We welcome any follow-up questions. Happy to answer uh, anything that comes up as you think about this. Feel free to send them to me um, and, and I'll uh, discuss them with the Clover team and we'll get back to you. Super, thank you. Um, Russ or Mike, is there anything that I'm missing? This is Mike, uh, not, not that I can think of. No, not from my perspective either. Okay, great. So thank you very much. I think we've all learned a lot this afternoon and uh, um, thank you. So with that, thank I'm you. gonna move to the next item on the agenda. Um, is there any old business to come before the board? Is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. Tom has moved and Robin has seconded to adjourn today's meeting. Um, I understand it's a beautiful day outside. I haven't seen it yet, but uh, hopefully everybody gets some time outside and uh, Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. We didn't vote. We didn't adjourn. Oh. We didn't adjourn, Kevin. We have to vote. <laughs> All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> bye bye.